really feel your presence, Lord. I feel you here so strong in this place, God. I feel you knocking on my heart for sure. And I know you must be on others, God. I just pray that we're fully aware and open to your presence, Lord, so that we can hear and so that we can listen for what it is that you want us to hear, God. My prayer this morning is just that, that we would just be willing, God, and able to just listen for you. Lord, you always have something that you want to share with us, God, but a lot of times we're just we're just talking too much, even in our own heads, God. May we just quiet, quiet our voices this morning, Lord. And God, I pray that you would be with Pastor Nay, Lord, as she brings this message. God, I pray that you would just be with her. God, and speak through her. Give her a peace and an assurance, Lord, that you are with her now and forever, God. I pray all of these things in your holy name. Amen. something like that. <clears throat> I'm not sure that we've encountered anything like Jesus. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to invite you to, we've been journeying through the cross to new life, and so I certainly want to invite you to do that if we've got up there, the Good Friday service at 7. I cannot urge you enough to be here Friday night to invite those um, even if you have not been here for the last seven weeks 
and you don't really know, um, one of the things that happens, um, if you've never come here to a Good Friday service, I can promise you this, if you come to one, you'll want to come every year. Because it's definitely something that is very moving and very impactful for people because it's really your time. It's not another service. You don't come in and we don't do worship. We don't do those things. It is literally an experience for you to connect with Christ through the cross. And so these crosses will all have things on. We kind of transform this sanctuary, bringing the pews in and doing a lot of different things. Uh, having one final cross up here. And so it's really, though, an experience between you and the Lord. It's not something you do with anybody. It's very quiet. Um, you come in and you journey through the crosses. And this particular year, we're going to journey through the crosses to new life. We are going to journey through what we've been talking about. Father, forgive them, for they do not know. Um, truly, I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. Woman, here is your son, and here is your mother. And my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I am thirsty. And we're going to journey through that. This room will have that. That cross will be the cross of we do not know. The cross of being powerless. Most of us think of that first statement, Father, forgive them. We focus on the forgiveness. And forgiveness is a powerful thing to focus on. The cross is all about forgiveness. But really that statement that Jesus is making is forgive them for they do not know. They do not know. They do not know that they are still dead in their sin. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. And then there's the invitation. That's why I kind of put it in green. And so those two crosses will be about the invitation to, um, to join into a life with someone who does have the power. We don't realize we actually don't have power. And the invitation to live with Jesus today in paradise and to become part of a family that isn't like any other family. Uh, to have a relationship that you've never experienced before. A relationship that is birthed out of what happens at the cross. A whole new life. And then after that, what, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We talked about that last week. Not all of you were able to be here. But my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is that point of emptiness. We need to experience emptiness. If we never experience emptiness, you will never thirst for God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall receive and inherit the kingdom of God. Well, you know, if you ever heard that uh, beatitude, that blessing that Jesus um, bestows in his first sermon, he talks about a truly blessed person is someone who knows what it means to be forsaken. A truly blessed person knows what it means to experience an emptiness. And I'm not talking about, as we talked about last week, I'm not talking about some of you going, oh man, I experience that every day. I'm not talking about you feeling pity, or you feeling sad, or you feeling in necessarily just momentary despair. But I'm talking about the feeling of emptiness that you get to that nothing is going to fix it. There isn't a place I can go to. There isn't a well that I've created in my life, referencing John 4, the woman at the well. There isn't something in my life that I've created to satisfy this thirst, this hunger, this missing, this aching part. You are all created, we were all created essentially with this emptiness. And, and, but God needs you to feel that emptiness. He needs you to become, I can tell you all day long that you're empty. I can tell you all day long that you need God, but until you know that you're empty, until you know that you need God, you will not seek him. So my God, my God, Jesus was experiencing in our place what it was to be without God for the first time in his life. He completely emptied himself. There's other scriptures in the word that talks about the emptying of Jesus. What are they talking about? Jesus uh, Philippians 2 talks about that um, who being the very nature of God did not consider something uh, equality with God, something to be grasped. Instead, he gave it up. Jesus has always is all God, but in this moment on the cross, Jesus experienced what you and I, what he's inviting you and I to experience. Jesus is actually inviting you to die. It's weird, right? Nobody ever invites somebody to die. But he needs you to because otherwise you won't experience life. Life occurs because of that death. 
So, there's, so we're going to spend time at those crosses, and some of you may need to spend a lot of time there because you've never experienced it. And because you've never experienced it, you've never understand why this thing called Christianity is so important. For, for many of us, I truly believe this, and when I say us, I don't mean us in our church, as much as us as those that call us Christians. I think there's a lot of people that are just involved in a lot of religious activity. They're committed to the religious activity. They believe in the existence of a God. But boy, surrendering their life to that God is really what Christianity is all about. And, and many of us are, have never even gotten there. And you need to. And then you will first. And today we're going to look at the final, uh, one of the last two statements of Jesus. The last statement you will experience on Good Friday, right up here. Father, into your hands I, I commit my spirit. But today we look at, after Jesus said, I'm thirsty, they, they took a jar of vinegar that was there. They soaked a, a sponge, filled it with the vinegar, and then they put it on a stalk of hyssop plant. And they raised it up to Jesus' lips. And when Jesus had received the drink, then he said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It is finished. Well, what is finished? You ever think about that? Some of us go, well, I mean, that's just the end of it. Finally, he's going to die. It's finished. He's dead. What is finished? Because it says, it is finished. Well, what is it? It's kind of going back to that, Father, forgive me. Everybody's really into the forgiveness. Let's talk about forgiveness. Let's talk about forgiveness. Forgiveness is only as powerful as you think you need to be forgiven. Sit with that for a while. But... We don't think about those other words as they do not know. They do not know. Well, think about this. Most of us look at the finish, which is important, but what is the it? It is finished. What is finished? What is finished is the work he came to do. This is, this is it. This is the mission that Jesus was sent to us to do. The mission that God sent himself in the flesh to do, it has now been accomplished. Death has been conquered. It is finished. The battle, the war, it's done. It is finished. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians. You can spend some time reading about that in, fifth, in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, Paul is actually talking to the church. If you're wondering the context of this, death has been swallowed up in victory. We love that verse. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where is your sting? Where is your power, essentially, is what that verse is saying. Because once Jesus, it is finished, he took away the power that death had on us. Well, Paul is talking to the believers in Corinth because there was disputes. Boy, it didn't take long as the church began to develop in, in the book of Acts when we see the church and it, it begins to take shape and people start gathering together because it looks very different than it was before Jesus died. Before Jesus died, it was temple worship. There were sacrifices. There was ritual. And there was all these things. There was a high priest and you confessed your sins to the priest. And, and the priest went in and absolved you of your sins. And there was all of these things that took place in the temple. That is not happening anymore. Because the veil is torn in two. There is no longer this temple. But now the believers are gathering together. And they're trying to create what this thing called church is going to be. Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So that church will prevail. Church will actually storm the gates of hell and push back. <laughs> so he's talking to this church, but it didn't take long for the church. Because once you, you know, church would be great if there were people. Amen. I'm with you on that. <laughs> you know, I mean, once you get people involved, we just mess it up. You know why? Because we're all just think we know everything. Because of that sin in us. Father, forgive them because they're clueless. I mean, you should say that prayer every morning. Lord, help me because I have no idea. That 
should be your morning prayer when you head out the door. I do not know. That, I mean, that should be in some of your, you people's vocabulary. Because there's a couple of you that say religiously this statement. I know, I know, I know, I know. If you say that one more time, I'm telling them bring my 380. I'm just like, I'm done with that word. You do not know. You do not know. Right? We really don't know. But unfortunately, we think we do. And so we try to create something. So in the early church, they had already started having problems. And everybody loved to play the part of the Holy Spirit. It's the favorite part in the church. Nobody wants to clean the toilets. Nobody wants to be on the sound system. Nobody wants to sing. Nobody wants to teach the preschoolers or change the diapers. But boy, if I were to put out an announcement saying, I'm looking for some people to be the Holy Spirit, all of you would rush this stage. Right? That's the greatest job in the church. Some of you are going, well, what's that job? That's the job where you get to get, go around and tell everybody what they're doing wrong. Come on, you know it. You're like, oh, man, I'm already doing that. <laughs> yeah, we just haven't given you a badge yet. Because there's no such job in the church. Unfortunately, we do. And that's what happened early on in the church. And so they were going around um, judging people. What to eat, what to wear, what not to eat, what not to wear. How to worship, how not to worship. Um, and so there's all sorts of problems, and Paul was addressing that when he's talking about this verse. He was, he was putting the focus back on the resurrected Christ and what church was really all about. That we do not gain favor with God through how we worship. We don't gain favor with God because we don't do a certain thing or do do a certain I tell you all the time, um, Jesus didn't die. He did not go to hell for our sinful behavior. He, he didn't go to hell because you lie, steal, and cheat. The lying, the stealing, the cheating, the doing the things that you're not supposed to do, that you know you're not supposed to do, that's detrimental to your body and to your family and to those around you, those are the things that are very natural acts of the sinful nature. Jesus did not die for your sinful behavior. He died for your sinful nature. So that your behavior would change. But he doesn't die for the behavior. And so Jesus died to set us free because it's the one thing that we actually do not have power over. Father, forgive them, for they do not know. They do not know that they actually don't have power over this. That they actually need this journey that I'm about to go on. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. Without the law, sin doesn't have any power. Uh... But thanks be to God, it gives us victory. Death is a whew, crazy thing. Father, forgive them, for they do not know. They do not know that they are dead in their sins. They do not know that they are powerless. Death is one thing that reminds us of our powerlessness. Unfortunately, this week, I've had to have this conversation a couple times because in our Brookside family, the school with which we're connected with here, um, a week ago today, a little six-year-old girl that's in our kindergarten class dropped dead um, in her mother and her parents' home. It's actually Ray's second cousin. We didn't know that until I was at the funeral, and Ray was there. And for no apparent reason, this little girl stopped breathing. And that was the end of her life. She wasn't sick. She had no heart condition. No problems. She simply told her mommy, my heart hurts. Crawled up in her mom's lap, told her, I love you. And then she died. Wow. Talk about not having power over death. I've had to speak to this all week, spending hours with the family, a family that I did not know until this moment. I was the little girl's chapel pastor, so I was able to speak at her funeral. Yeah, try to speak to a funeral of people about death. But death, we hate death. Death is the one thing in our world that reminds us of our powerlessness. Do you know that most of us live with a false sense that we actually have control over our life until a little girl does something like that? And then it reminds us very quickly that there's nothing I can do to stop that. There's nothing we can do to stop death. We're trying to do it all the time. Why do you think that in 
the world who are constantly on missions and raising money to figure out how to prolong life. And really, in a sense, what we're doing is we are trying to figure out the one thing that the reality is we will never figure out is how to stop death. It doesn't matter what you do. You like it. You can eat healthy. You can be the healthiest person. This little girl was as healthy as anything. There was no indication anything was wrong with her. She simply was breathing one moment, and the next moment she wasn't. It's over. Some of you have experienced tragedy where maybe you've lived a completely healthy life, and you get in a car, and a drunk driver hits and kills you. You have no control over death. And that, my friends, is the hardest thing for us. Because we all live with this illusion that we actually have some control over our life. And as a result, we actually start believing this lie that we have some control over our destiny. And the truth of the matter is, we don't. And death reminds us of that. When we go to a funeral, we're reminded of that. Especially a funeral of a precious little girl that for no apparent reason, and we want a reason. Do you know every person I say this story to this week, and we talk about it, is to say, you know what they ask? Why? Do they know what's wrong? Have you found out what's wrong? Has the autopsy come back? What happened? What happened? Why do we need to know what happened? Because somehow it brings us back to a place of control. Maybe if I know the reason, it'll make sense, and then it'll be a peace in my mind. It's that need for control. Father, forgive them, for they do not know that they are dead in their sins. Death is the one thing that continues to remind us of our powerlessness. We live with a false sense that we actually have control. But death creeps in and it rears its ugly head and makes us face our powerlessness. But thanks be to God, who always leads in triumph. For he and he only has the power over life and death. He is the only one. And we can try. For, it's one of the reasons why we fear global warming. We fear the coming end of this world. We fear dying. We're trying to put off what is absolutely inevitable. Death is coming. We will pass on from this life. But see, we in the church, we have a hope. Because we know that for us, death does not end our life. We go on into that next chapter in our life. It simply becomes more of a comma. <laughs> we simply, I, like I told the family on Friday, Delilah sim simply has a new address. Death did not end her life. It simply ended it here. Do you know that death was never part of God's plan? And I reminded the family of that Friday. Death has never been a part of God's plan. If you don't believe me, read Genesis. There was no death. The first death that ever occurred in the Bible was an animal that was sacrificed to cover Adam and Eve's shame. Do you know that in, if you read in Genesis, you'll actually discover that even the animals did not kill each other. They were all vegetarians. Read it. It talks about how seed-bearing plants were given for all of the animals and any of us that had life to eat. There were not animals killing other animals to get food, and there wasn't humans killing animals to get food. And so the cycle of life that we've all learned about growing up. That's the cycle of human life. That's not the cycle of spiritual life. But see, we're all fallen from Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve said, we want to be God. I tell you this over and over. One of these days it'll stick. Adam and Eve wanted to be their own God. That's the only thing that tree offered them. That tree was like all the other trees. It offered them the opportunity to have wisdom, to have knowledge, to have power. What they didn't know was that it was only going to be a limited amount of power. Oh, we will give them power, but a very limited amount. They will never be God. 
They can never get to the place, much like we futilely try to do, is to figure out how to make it so nobody dies. It's, I mean, scientists are spinning their wheels. That's not, you're not going to be able to figure out the cure to not die. It, it is going to happen. From the moment we're born, we're dying. From dust we came, dust we shall return. God says, if you want to do it, there you go, best of luck. But you cannot, you cannot have the best of both worlds. You cannot draw on me and experience eternal life. You chose the tree of death. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, and I told you that you will die if you eat it. And death came into our world. Death was never part of God's plan. But death is the cost for sin. That's how come we die. I had some teachers ask me this week, what do you say, pastor, to a family of, of, of why this child died? You know, people like say, well, God wanted her. She was such a sweetie, and God wanted her in heaven and to be an angel. Nobody becomes an angel. So I understand that it's a sweet concept, but Delilah does not become an angel. Angels are a completely different created being than humans. Whole different splendor, if you read, even in Corinthians, it'll show you that. So, so, so the teachers are like, well, what do you say to them? What do you say is why? Well, why? Because we want to be our own God. And because we want to be our own God, and we're all fallen from Adam and Eve, we're all born with that same predisposition, we're all born with that same idea, that same lie that says we can live forever, that we have power over death. We're all born with that. We're all born with sin. And as a result, we will die. All of us, unless Christ comes back before that and takes us to be with him. You see, Jesus came and accomplished what the law was powerless to do. The law, I'm going to give you guys a little lesson here. After Easter, I'm going to do a study on some foundations of faith, and I really encourage you to be a part of that so you understand, because I'm going to start navigating here through some really confusing stuff. But Jesus came to accomplish what the law was powerless to do, because the law came about... And when we're talking about the law, we're talking about, to make it in terms you all understand, maybe Ten Commandments. There's actually quite a few more than ten, but let's just see if we can get ten. Most of us can't even keep five out of the ten, but we'll do our best, right? There's actually about 613, so buckle in, right? So God creates law, the Ten Commandments, we'll say. Well, what was the purpose of that? Well, the purpose, and if you really want to do a study on it, and I told you guys to be reading some of this stuff, if you read Romans 1 through 8, you'll see what I'm talking about. Your brain won't hurt, but you'll see what I'm talking about. But the, what the law does is the law was brought about to make us aware of our sin. If you didn't have the law, you wouldn't know you're sinning, as Paul says it. Right? So some are thinking, well, geez, then just don't create the law. <laughs> you need the law. The law makes us aware of sin. It makes us aware of our sinful behavior. Paul talks about, if, if I didn't have the law and I didn't know it was not okay to covet, when I coveted, I didn't know that would be wrong. And I'm paraphrasing, but Paul's talking about that in Romans 6 and 7, 5, 6 and 7. If you look at Romans 5, he says that the law was added so that the trespass might increase. Let me use a word that's a bit better. The law was added so that sin might increase. And you go, what? So God wanted sin to increase? No. He wanted you to be aware of your sin. You want to be aware of your sin. Because sin is killing you. And if you don't know about it, it's not going to stop because you don't know. Let me give you an analogy I gave my high schoolers. If I'm driving down the road and I'm speeding, right, and, the, and I pass a sign, but I don't see the sign, and somewhere along the line, maybe some teens went along, pulled it out of their own, put it in their garage. Okay, so there's no sign. And I don't realize that now I've crossed over and I'm doing 50, 
55 and a 35. I'm speeding. I'm breaking the law. But I didn't see the sign. So the officer pulls me over and I say, I didn't see the sign. So thus, I shouldn't have to pay the ticket. It doesn't work that way. The officer has every right to give me a ticket because I'm breaking the law. Whether I know about it or not is irrelevant. So here's the thing. Next time, in fact, I don't know about you, but when I'm driving through streets, have you ever done this in areas you don't know? You think, man, I need to see a speed limit sign here pretty quickly. Because if I don't see a speed limit sign, and I, I could get a ticket. I could be speeding, I don't know it. Because my responsibility, I want to know what the law is. You want to know what the law is. Because the law makes you aware of sin. And sin, there's a penalty for sin. It is death. Jesus, God said it in the beginning. If you want to do this yourself, then the cost is death. It's not what he wants, but it's the cost. The law was given to make us aware of sin. And it's good because the cost of sin is death. And that is a price you and I cannot and will not be ever able to pay. Just because we don't know about the law does not make us accountable to the cost of the law. I think a lot of us love doing the spiritual ignorance game. Well, I'll just stand before God and say, oh, I didn't know. Really? Yes, you did. Remember that feeling you got? Remember that neighbor that invited you to church? Remember when the pastor said over and over to get into a discipleship class? Remember over and over when people would tell you at church, hey, you should come to Bible study. Hey, you should take a discipleship class. Hey, you should learn. Well, if you know God, I just didn't have time. So, I mean, we're good, right? You're not going to hold me accountable to... <laughs> God is a just God. And you know what we like to fall on is, well, God is a loving God. He is a loving God. But him being a loving God does not negate him being a justful God. They don't, they don't cancel each other out. In his love, he is a justful God. You never have to know where God is standing. So Jesus came to do away with that death. Jesus came to take our place. Jesus came to conquer death. He came to, so that, because that's the thing that holds us. That's the thing that the one thing that the enemy had, even had with, was trying to have with Jesus, is death. Death is this debt that we cannot pay. And so Jesus came and he conquered that debt. Jesus came and, remember I told you, was forsaken, what you and I are supposed to be. He was forsaken for us so that we could be accepted. So what Jesus did on the cross is he opened up the way so we can now reach out and take from the tree of life. Because when Adam and Eve chose to be their own God and start on this journey of doing life on their own, which now includes death, which now includes death, the Bible says they cannot reach out and take from the tree of life and live forever. So Jesus comes to be the tree of life. Jesus comes to be the bread of life. Jesus comes to open up the way so that we can reach out now and take from him the tree of life. That's what happens on Good Friday and Easter, is that we can now reach out and live forever. Jesus conquered death. He did away with the, the, the hold that death has on us. He paid a debt. We're done. We're not bound to that death anymore. The reality and the truth is that many of us, though, and, and I would even say uh, it's possible that most of us in this room sometimes still live as though death has not been conquered. We still live as though we are in bondage to that death. We live our new life in Christ with old ways of thinking. It astonishes me how many people are not radically changed by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ in your life. You still are acting the same way you acted before. There's nothing that's changing. 
And that astounds me. You have old ways of thinking. You've added going to church. You've added praying a little. You've added doing some of these things. You've, you're at least trying to memorize five to ten commandments, right? You're just, you're, you're trying. And there's so many of us that we live our new life in Christ with old ways of thinking, trying somehow to attain that which we could never have attained without the blood of Christ. We're still trying to gain God's favor. When you do something bad, it's kind of like, it really surprises me how many people ask, and I just put it out to you guys right now, I answer in your head, not out loud. But if you were to die like that six-year-old right now, boom, die. What do you think would happen to you? And I would bet that there's more than you all realize in this room that just said in your mind, oh, I hope I go to heaven. You hope. I guarantee you that there's more than you realize in this room that are not absolutely certain of what's going to happen to them should they drop dead like that six-year-old last week. You really are not sure. Really. And, and why do you think people think that? You know why? Because you immediately think about your life. You immediately think how you're a bad person. You immediately think how you've done bad things. It's, it's why the pastor gets this question. I used to get this question all the time. I don't get it so much anymore. But for, for years, people will say, so I'm just curious. What do you think? So if I'm a Christian, and I'm in my car, and I'm driving along, a person cuts me off. And so I say, F you, flip them off, right? And uh, aren't you glad I said with the, the F instead of the word? So anyway, but I'm being videotaped. It's weird. But anyway, so they say that. All of a sudden, boom, I get in the car accident. I'm dead. So they go, so, what happens? Do I make it? Are you serious? Yeah. Would, would, wouldn't I go to hell? Why, why do you think you go to hell? Well, because I sin. Okay, sin because you said F you? Yes. And, and I got hit really hard, and so I didn't have time to confess it. It's like, oh my God, that's fabulous. Um, that's why people think everybody that commits suicide goes to hell. Wow, is that a misnomer. Everybody that commits suicide does not go to hell, people. Get that out of your mind. But we think it, and you know why we think people that commit suicide go to hell? is because one, they're murdering, and since they're murdering themselves, and because everybody always remembers that commandment, hey, I know one out of ten, you ain't supposed to kill people. Oh, that's good, you're on the start, right? So if I kill myself, and then I die, I can't say sorry for it. So I'm going to go to hell. This is fabulous logic. This is why the pastor says get into a discipleship class. Because we're clueless about the law. We really are. Jesus, Jesus actually came to fulfill the law, to be the law. And it is amazing how we think about it. That's why I said, most of you, if I were to ask, what would happen to you today if you dropped out of a heart attack right now? And some of you are like, oh, I hope I'd be with Jesus. I can say unequivocally, without any doubt, without any hesitation, that if I were to drop dead, first I'd say thank you, Jesus. Then, because I've had all I can of this life, but I have no question in my mind that I would go on to be with Jesus. It would be wonderful. I have absolute blessed assurance. And I know there's at least one of you there saying, well, that's kind of weird. Statement, thinking that you're just going to go right to heaven. I didn't say I was going to sit at the right hand of the Father. <laughs> right? But I'm going to go to heaven. I have no doubt. Many of you in this room should have that same assurance. We should all have that assurance. But what we do is, we think about our behavior. So this is why some of you are still living in bondage to the death. Well, I did bad things. Well, I cussed and I did all these things, and I'm going to have to do a sermon on cussing for you guys, right? But we, I love how everybody is so concerned with saying a bad word, yet like they're having an affair or something. It's like, maybe work on that first and then the language later, right? I, I trust you, James. I don't think that's a problem for you. But many of us are still trying to gain God's favor through the law, what we can do. And do you know why? It's, I'm going to tell you this. I was telling some teachers this this week. Here's one of the reasons that people are drawn to behavior modification sermons. 
Let me say that word again because I'm going to be like, behavior what? Behavior modification sermons. A pastor or a church would call them life application sermons. They're great. How to fix your marriage in six weeks. Some of you that are single are going to do that so that I don't have to come for six weeks, right? <laughs> How to get out of debt God's way. That's fabulous, right? They're, and they're great. They're great messages, and they're, and they're godly messages. And God wants to tell you how to get out of debt. God wants to tell you how to live your life with the stuff he's given you. He does. We're going to do a whole series after Easter on really being a steward of what God's given us. There's nothing wrong with those type of sermons. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with them, but we like them. And do you know why we like them? Because then it focuses on what I can do. We like to just tell me what to do and I will do it. Just tell me what to do and I will do it. Remember what Paul said? What a wretched man I am. There's this law of sin at work in my body. This Romans 5 when he's talking about it. If you look at Romans 7, he and many of you know this verse, is where Paul says, I do the things I'm not supposed to do, and what I'm not supposed to do, I continually find myself to do. What a wretched man I am. Because there is this law of sin and spirit, and it's a battle within me. What can I do? Because I want to have God's favor. I don't want to die. I don't want to go to hell. That's why some of you are crossing your fingers, right? Come on. Right? I want to go to heaven. But I'm not a good person. I'm a wretched person. So we like behavior modification sermons because it puts power back on me. Just tell me what I need to do. This is why when people are asked at a funeral,